nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. There is no other fount I know, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your fellowship with us. We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness and tender mercies. If it had not been for your mercies, where would we have been? Where would we be? Because of your mercies, we are not consumed. We are not destroyed. We are not obliterated. But because you love us with everlasting love, because you were merciful to us sinners, we are here today to give you thanks and give you praise and to give you worship for what you have done. We thank you, Lord, for your word that came through your son. Because he is the ancient of days. He is the voice of God. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the Logos. He is the written word. He is the spoken word. He is everything. We know about you by him. The revelation that came to us about you comes through him. Sure. And by the spirit of your spirit, your living spirit. Today we thank you for your word again. And as we study your word and as we speak your word, let everything be said in that will bring honor and glory to your precious name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Pastor Peter, we are happy to have you back again with us. Thank yes. you. Thank God for you. Yes. Thank God for taking you safely and sure. bringing you back. Amen. Yes. Amen. It's by His grace. Yes. Today we are happy to be here. It is God's goodness that we are not consumed. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And we thank God for His word. And we can look at the text that is we found in Isaiah. Again, we can look at Isaiah chapter 53. And we can read from verse 4 to 12. And then we are going to look at 1 Peter 2. Some scriptures there. Isaiah 53 mm -hmm. from verse 4. And this is what it says. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, or by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin he has put him to grief when he made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spies of the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Again, we are dealing with this topic, the doctrine of the atonement, appointment with death. And this is going to be part three. Appointment with death, part three. Hallelujah. Now we were talking about this thing for two sessions already. And it is amazing that Christ was put to grief. He was put to grief, Pastor Peter. His Bible says he was put to grief for our sins, for our transgressions. He was put to grief by the Father. And you know, we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 
to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear certain time apart from sin for salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. But before that, in verse 27, where we get our text from, appointment with death, it says that, and as it is appointed for men once to die, or to die once, afterwards comes the judgment. Yeah, it is appointed, appointed unto man once. once to die. Every man has an appointment with death. Mm. Every woman, every child, every person that is born, born of a woman, have an appointment with death. The only way you're going to escape that appointment with death is if the law returns and you are caught up to meet him in the air alive. Because Paul says, those that are us that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those ones that were in the grave, that were resurrected, and so shall we always forever be with the Lord. Remember I said, it pleased the Lord to bruise Christ. And last session we have mentioned a word bruise bruise daka d-a-k-a -A, a hebrew word to crush to bruise to smite to oppress to beat to pieces to humble you know jesus was humble he was meek and lowly he was humble he became obedient unto death he humbled himself and came obedient unto death even the death of the cross why did he do that? For our sins. Mm -hmm. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was placed upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. That word chastisement means the punishment that we deserve. The, the, not, it's not correction, Pastor. It's not dealing with correction. That word chastisement is not dealing with correction. It's dealing with punishment. Punishment for sin. And we know that the ways of sin is death. The chastisement that we deserve, the punishment that we deserve was placed upon him. And because he bore the sins, the sins of many, we are here today. He has put them to grief, right? Shalah, put to grief, afflicted, wounded. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised. And again, that word bruised means to crush, Pastor. You know, like if you have corn or millet and you crush it, or you beat it with a mortar, you beat it to, to pieces, pound it, pound it mm. to, get, to get flour, to get a paste, if it, if it add water. That's how Christ went through. Went through. That's how he, he it actually is depicting that kind of treatment. And who did it? The Father. Mankind was the instrument that God the Father used. But he said it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It wasn't man that, that actually did it, even though they did it out of their anger and their malice and their hatred and their sinful ways. But it was the Father that caused it and allowed it. And it was a, it's a reason. If he didn't do it, we only here today. <laughs> but remember, it was Christ that voluntarily appeared. Surrender himself yes. under under the working of the father, of the under the bruising. If you look at millet or corn or wheat, it's passive, right? It has no life in itself. It doesn't move. No. You can do whatever you want with it. But when it was talking about Jesus, he said that, and as a lamb before the shears is dumb, oh. so he opened out his mouth. Mm. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Mm. That's the Lord. The Lord himself, Jesus himself, led, was led as a lamb. He went voluntarily then. He didn't resist. He didn't rebel. He didn't refuse. And the cup was bitter, Pastor. It wasn't a street cup. He said, Lord, Father, if it is all possible, let this cup pass from me. It's too much. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And then he says in John, it, it was for this reason that I was brought to this place. It was for this cause I was brought to this place. That I will lay down my life a ransom for many. And we are the many. We are the ones. And we're going to deal with that word taught many. Who are the many? Who are the ones that he died for? That's what we want to get to. That's our objective. But let's look there for a minute from verse 21 
to verse 25. First Peter chapter 2 from verse 21. For this you were called because Christ also suffered for us. Christ also suffered for us. Because Christ suffered for us, he left an example that we should follow in his steps. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his share is done, so he opened not his mouth. Peter says that when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judged righteously. It Plead the Father to bruise him. So he committed himself to the Father who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Cursed is anyone that hangs upon a tree. He became a curse for us. That we, having died to sins, see that sins, more than one, plural, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes we were healed. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that was supposed to be for us was placed upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But have now returned to the shepherd and overstay of your souls. Amen. So see pastor, this is a very serious thing here. Yeah. And we appreciate it very much. What can we say to all these things? What can we conclude? And say, Lord, we thank you for being merciful to me. To me. To me. To us. To mankind. <laughs> sinners. <laughs> Isaiah 53. Verse 10. The latter clause. Actually, verse 11. Isaiah 53, verse 11. It says, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear the iniquities that's a very serious statement there Isaiah 9 6 and 7 it says that for unto us for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. That's right. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish with it with judgment and justice. From this time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know, the zeal, the determination the judicial everlasting omnipotent pleasure determination of the law to perform this this is not something that is haphazard this is not something that is like a sporting moment this is a plan hallelujah Amen. so we read Isaiah 53 verse 5 and 6 we read that but I want to read, I want to read this statement again from the Amplified Virgin. Isaiah f chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Okay. For to us, a child is born. To us. Because we want to see, remember we are talking about many, right? Who are the many? And Isaiah said, for only us. Who are the us? For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, our Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it 
and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness for the latter time forth, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts have performed this. So, who are the many that Christ underwent this suffering for? Under us a son is born. And remember when I said that term given, for under us a son is given. Given means given up as a sacrificial lamb for slaughter. He was given up by the father. So when Isaiah was prophesying, he says a son is born. That's his incarnation. A son is given. Given for what reason? Why did God give his son? Why did he come into the world? Paul said he came into the world to save sinners. That to which he is chief. For God so loved the world oh, that he gave, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. He only begot his son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right. So when it says gave, it means give up to death. Oh. He sacrificed his only begotten son. Remember, Abraham said to Isaac about the question, Father, here's a wood, here's a fire, where's the sacrifice? Abraham replied, God himself shall provide a sacrifice. God himself, the Father himself shall supply a sacrifice. The Father himself will give up his only begotten son as a sacrificial lamb to the slaughter for our sin. That's what it really means. But who are the many? We. So when we consider it, that word many, there are many scriptures that use alternate words like us, we, the elect. Mm -hmm. They all relate the elect. and refer to the same individual. Many are called but few are chosen. Oh, come on, oh, yes. He laid his life for many, right? Now, let's look at Romans chapter 5 for a minute. And we will come across these words they are used frequently by Paul. Romans 5, from verse 1. Okay. And I really amplify version. Okay. Therefore, since we, see that word we, are justified, acquitted, and declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us gra grasp the fact that we, have the peace of reconciliation to hold to and enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the United One. Eight. But God shows and clearly proves His own love for us. Now, what we were talking about, we, yes. us, yeah, that by the fact that while we we are still sinners. Christ the Messiah died for us. See that word us again? How it appears? Us and we. Therefore says we are justified, acquitted, and made righteous and brought into right relation with God by Christ's blood. How much more certain is it that we shall be saved by him from the indignation of and wrath of God. Remember, it pleased the Lord to bruise him he has put into shame. So we were acquitted. We were set free. We were declared to be righteous by God the Father on the basis of and by Christ dying and shedding his blood. You know that word shedding? You know, we, we always hear the scripture about the shedding of blood is no remiss, no sin. That's right. It doesn't say by Christ's death alone that we receive forgiveness of sins. You know, you can die. As I said, it's a point until man wants to die. Afterwards, the judgment. You can die in various forms. You can, you can die even without shedding blood. You can just die for heart attack. I can, or you can just die of old age. Mm -hmm. But no blood is shed. You know what the idea of shedding of blood is? A violent death. It's like murder then in, in, in the old vernacular if somebody murder you and they hack you death with, a, with a, a machete or shoot you and you bleed out. Your blood is shed. So it's a violent act. So Christ didn't die uh, like a, a my passive act or uh, action or uh, a my passive way. He died violently. Brutally. That's why, he, that's why he says shed. Blood must be shed. 
And if my blood is shed, you're dead, dead, dead. That's why he said he was led to the slaughter. When we think about the word slaughter, we think about an animal that is slaughtered, that is killed for food. Or maybe for its, its coat that we can make clothing, its skin. So that is a violent thing. Blood is shed. So that's why he says, Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, and made righteous and brought into right relationship with God by Christ's blood. How much more certain it is that we shall be saved by him from the indignation and wrath of God. If you know, if there's no shedding of blood, God's wrath will be poured out. So you see how, the, how these two words are not going to sit together, Pastor? Shedding of blood and wrath to come. God's wrath is not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be passive. It's not going to be a peaceful thing. God's wrath is going to be violent. It's going to be a violent explosion of his indignation upon sin and wickedness and evil. Oh, you know, God loves the sinner, so he's going he's gonna to, like, you know, ignore them and tolerate them. No no no, 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 no. If you are not in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. If you're not in Christ, God's wrath will be put upon you. God is a consuming fire. He says, vengeance is my, I will repair all. And when we talk about vengeance, we talk about like making right by any means necessary to, to get rid of sin and its pollution. And God, and God has the answer. Is that a man that don't know what, how, what and how to deal with sin or how to deal with evil? God knows. It's not going to be a pleasant thing. And it, and it must be so. Because sin is evil and wicked. And I'm not just. So you need a powerful, strong force to destroy it. And, and to overcome it. And to remove it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yes. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the blood must be shed. But us and we and many. Listen, let's continue with, with um, Romans chapter 5. Now look at this part here in verse verse 10 for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son it is much more certain now that we are reconciled that we shall be saved daily delivered from sin dominion through his resurrection life when we were enemies now I said that we can consider words like us we many and the elect, and they all refer to the same thing. But something also is being mentioned in verse 10. In verse 10, they have words there like enemy, or enemies, ungodly, and sinners. So you know what's on the pastor? Before we were reconciled to God, we were enemies. We were sinners. We were ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were wicked and obnoxious, Christ died for us. But, but why did Christ die for us? Why did he die for us? Why did he not die for, the, for the, the rest of mankind that will go to hell? Why did he not die for them? Because they're not his. They were not given to him by the Father. The Father gave us to Christ as a charge. You know, we all, we all sin. We all fell in, 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 into sin in Adam. The first Adam was a uh, uh, like a, a living soul he violated God's law and because of his violation he caused death to fall upon all mankind all mankind without exception every single man is guilty before God because of Adam's sin but God you know something that we got to consider before God allowed Adam to fall into sin he had already given us the we the many the elect to Christ as a charge. Before we fell into sin in Adam, we were given to Christ as a charge. But God allowed us to fall into sin in Adam because that's, that is the only way we could be born. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. So how can a man exist? How can a man come in existence unless he is born? Adam was the one that God used to represent all mankind. So he allowed us to fall into sin in Adam. 
But before we were given to Adam to bear us, like to, to procreate us, we were given to Christ spiritually as a child so that we would be redeemed, that we could be set free by Christ when he comes. That that blood that will be shed will be used on our behalf. It's quite obvious that God could have used Christ's blood to, to save any, any as much as he chooses to. That's a fact, right, Pastor? But he didn't do that. He chose some. He elected some. And you know, we don't appreciate it sometimes. We don't understand it sometimes. He chose some. He left some in their state. Every single person that was born of Adam deserved to die. The way of sin is death. Every single one of us deserves to die. It is not by works of righteousness that we are saved. It is not by our own works. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is, a, it is God's gracious gift. We were given to Christ long ago, before time. Romans 5, verse 11. Again, he said, not only so, but we. You see that word of we again? Also rejoice and exultantly glory in God in his love and perfection through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we again have now received and enjoy our reconciliation. Our torment. You see that? We're dealing with the doctrine of a torment. Pastor, this word we and our can come continue to appear and reappear. Because it's dealing with a specific people. It's dealing with a group of people. Not every single individual in the world. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death as the result of sin, so death spread to all men. See? All men. No one been able to stop it. Or escape its power because all men sin. When did we sin? All of us sin in Adam. All men. As long as you are born, you are born a sinner. The only way you can say a, a, a man is not a sinner is if he was never born. Mm. If you're not born, it means you have no existence. Yeah. Jesus made a statement about Judas Iscariot, right. son of perdition. It was better for him not to be born. But Job said, man that is born of woman is of a few days and his life is full of trouble. Because of sin. Right? It's because of sin. Man that is born is born a sinner. Until he's redeemed, or unless he's redeemed, unless he's reconciled, unless his sins are forgiven, unless his sins are remitted by Christ's blood. Verse 13. Romans 5 13. To be sure, sin was in the world before ever the law was given. He's talking about the law of Moses. But sin is not charged to men account where there is no law to transgress. Yet, death has sway from Adam to Moses, the lawgiver, even over those who do not themselves transgress. A positive command as Adam did. Adam was a type, a prefigure of the one who was to come in reverse. The former destructive, the latter saving. Sin is a violation of the law. So if there's no law to, to violate it, you cannot be a judge to be a sinner. But if death reigned from Adam to Moses, it means that there had to be sin. And there had to be a law. Because when you violate the law, the soul that saves dies. What law was it? It wasn't the law of Moses. Because that came on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. God gave Moses a law. God gave to Adam, don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. Because in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. This law was given first to Adam. Adam had a law, a command. He violated it. And it only takes one, Pastor. The guy, it doesn't matter if it's 50 or 100, one is enough. You're going to say, well... He told Adam not to eat, and Adam ate. Where should that be considered damnation for the whole of the race, whole race of mankind? He violated God's law. One. One, one man disobedient. One act is enough. And it caused all mankind to be considered 
sinners before God. That's what it says there. But look, there's a distinction. He's drawing like a reference or a type. Adam is prefigured the Christ that would come. One man's act of disobedience called all mankind to fall into sin. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The many, us, the believer, the elect, the chosen, the one that believes, the one that walks humbly before God, not the whole world. You see, again, again, God is not duplicitous. He doesn't set you free in Christ and then hold you responsible for your sin. He doesn't say, well, Christ died for your sin and then at the end of the day, hold you responsible for your sin. Because that is what man say that Christ died for the whole world. If that was the case, God would be unrighteous to send a man to hell because Christ died for the sin of the whole world. But doctrinally speaking, God will never ever place man's sin upon Christ. Let Christ pay personally for that person's sin. And then at the end of the day, turn around and still hold that person responsible for that sin. That sin that should have been removed, that would have been remitted by the shedding of Christ's blood. God will not do that. If Christ died for your sins and you believe on that basis, your sins are forgiven. God cannot now hold you responsible for that sin. Because you know what? Then how can you ever receive eternal life? Because the way that sin is death. And this thing is eternal death. You cannot have eternal death and eternal life at the same time. It's an impossibility. You must have one or the other. So when Christ died for your sin, it means that you have been forgiven. Or you will be forgiven. But God's free gift is not at all to be compared to the trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. It's greater. For if many died through one man's fall in the way, his lap or his offense, much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor of one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. My righteous servant shall justify many. See that word many again? We are trying to show that there are many it have a specific meaning in view. Not the whole world. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many. Now, is the free gift at all to be compared to the effects of that one man's sin? You can't compare everlasting life to eternal death. There's no comparison. You know, Adam did something. But what can you do to save yourself? What can you do that to make you appear justified before God? How can you justify yourself before God? There's nothing you can do. It's because of God's gracious gift to Jesus Christ that we are set free. So there's no comparison. Look, he said, For the sinners following the trespass of one man brought condemnation or brought death. Adam action brought death. Whereas the free gift following many transgressions bring justification and an act of righteousness. Pastor, we are held accountable for Adam's sin. There is no sin. But we also in ourselves commit many sins. Many trespasses. Adam committed one. But we committed many. And another thing to Adam was perfect. Adam was innocent. He knew the will of God and the purpose of God fully. So he wasn't encumbered by sin, the sin nature as yet. When he fell into sin, he was perfect, right? He was holy and righteous. But he fell into sin. Willingly. Now we are encumbered by sin. We have the sin nature. And if God doesn't allow his grace to come upon us or his mercy, we will have no like answer for sin. We will not be able to, to stop ourselves from sinning. You're going to say, man, you know, I can stop from sinning. You can't stop yourself from sinning. Only when you have come to Christ, only when you have been renewed, only when you have been forgiven and it's dwelling spirit empowers you, that you'll be able to walk holy before God and the word of God is in you. To strengthen you and to correct you, to guide you. If it is not 
I had not beef in West Africa, where would we be? No. No man. No man can overcome sin by himself. It's an impossibility. Sin is a grievous thing. No. Verse 17. No, I'm sorry. Let's read. Let's read. Go down to verse 18. Well then, as one man trustless, one man falls dead, and fallen will lead to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness lead to acquittal, and right standing with God, and life for all men. See that word all again? That word all, it means all that believe, all that God forgives, all that Christ died for, all that are reconciled to God, not all mankind in totality. See, sometimes these words come together. We gotta be able to differentiate between the, the reading and the meaning. For just as by one man disobedient or failing to hear, heedlessness and carelessness, the many, again that word many, were constituted sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be constituted righteous, made acceptable to God, and brought into right standing with God. We can stop there. But there's two times that that word many is used in verse 19. And you got, again, we got to differentiate between the two. By one man disobedient, many were made sinners. But all then, all and many in that particular rendering means the same thing. Every single man that a woman or a child that will be born were made sinners by Adam's death. Because when I say death, I mean, I mean spiritual death. Right. By his disobedience. Because if Adam didn't die spiritually, we would, not be, we would not die spiritually. If Adam didn't fall short of the glory of God, we could not fall short. He died first. Right. Adam died spiritually first. And, it, and that death came upon all mankind, both physical and spiritual. And then, at the end of the day, eternal death. But now look at the second part. It says, So by one man's, or so by Christ's obedience, the many, mm -hmm. so by one man's obedience, the many will be constituted righteous, made acceptable and brought in the right standing with God. The many. Who are the many then? Maybe we are talking about who are the many. Yes, We're trying to show you who are the many. The elect. The elect. And Paul used the word we and us. Many. It's the same thing. The many are the ones that Christ died for. Remember, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The testament that was for our peace was laid upon him. And with his strike, we are healed. If you are not in those ones, you cannot be saved. You're not healed. You're still remaining in your sin. When we consider the word like us and many and the elect, they all refer to the same thing. And before conversion, words like ungodly and sinner and enemy describes the action of the elect before they were converted. Ephesians 2 says that. And he has quickened us who were dead in trespasses and sins. Sin. He has quickened us. He has made us alive. We were walking according to the course of this world. We were acting just like the children of disobedience. Oh. We were on the sway of the devil. But he was rich in mercy towards us in that he, he loved us. He delivered us. He set us free. You know, we were under God's wrath. We were children of wrath even as others. We were counted as, 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 as like sinners to be destroyed. But God will not destroy us. Because he has already made provision for our, our regeneration. For our justification. For our deliverance. That is the only way, Pastor. If, if salvation wasn't in God's plan for us before time. How could, we, how could we come and say, well, I, I, I accept Christ as Savior. I believe in Jesus Christ. How could I have been redeemed? If it, if it wasn't in God's plan and purpose. Christ had to be set up as Savior, as Lord, as mediator before we sin. God doesn't do things after the fact. You can't sin and then expect God to find a, a remedy for your sin. He had to have had a remedy for sin in place already. So that he can utilize the tool 
all these benefits on our behalf. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. You know there's two things see that is being mentioned in that scripture. You see that word? Condemnation. Therefore, as by the offense of one, mm -hmm. judgment came, up. came upon all men to condemnation. Mm -hmm. You know what I was really saying to you, Pastor? Mm -hmm. And what judgment? Judgment is eternal death. Mm -hmm. Condemnation signifies, I would say, being condemned to death. Because when we look at the second clause, it says, even so by the rightness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. What is the free gift? Salvation. It's by grace that we are saved. Or, I can say eternal life. Amen. You see? By Christ's righteousness, or by Christ's obedience, eternal life was bestowed to us. Eternal life was given to us. So, eternal life or our lesson is free gift and justification of life is the same thing. Because what is justification of life? Eternal life. You have a right to live. You have a right to eat from the tree of life. You have a right to eternal existence in God's presence. So justification means that you, there's therefore no, no condemnation, right? You're not under condemnation. Because if you're under condemnation, you mean that you're under a death sentence. You're sentenced to death. Eternal death. So the justification of life. Or you're condemned to die. So by Adam's one offense. Now I, I said one act. Uh, one violation. Judgment came to condemn all men. All men, pastor. All men without exception. Both the righteous and the unrighteous. By Adam's one offense, judgment came to condemn them to eternal damnation, without exception, upon all of Adam's sons, even upon the elect also. That's what, that's, that's what Adam, Adam's violation did. But wait a minute. There's an escape here. This is condemnation to eternal death. Says what? The ways of sin is death. Adam knew that. And the day you eat of the tree, in the midst of the garden, you shall surely die. This wasn't fictional. This wasn't like a, a misunderstood statement. It was a statement of fact that Adam knew. That was told to Adam. And Adam had the mindset, he had the ability to understand it wasn't something foreign to him. So when he chose to violate the law of God, he did it deliberately, knowing that he will die. But I, I cannot even like criticize Adam because sometimes we do the same thing. We know that we know that we are violating God's law and sometimes we still do it. Mm. Even though we have the Holy Spirit that is like I would say urging us, leading us, we still violate God's law. But Adam was in a state of perfection, but we had the Holy Spirit. So, I would say that it's the same thing, Pastor. Man that is born of woman is a obnoxious creature. If we allow sin to have dominion in us, we will do the same thing like Adam. That's why Paul admonished us, don't let sin have dominion over you. Don't let sin have rulership in your mortal bodies. Don't let sin override the law of God in you or the Spirit of God in you. The, the, the correction, the Holy Spirit at work in you. Don't let the sin sway you to violate God's law. Don't let sin control you. But I made that statement that all men were under condemnation because of Adam's sin. But there's an avenue of escape here. When we look at Hebrews 9.22, it says that 
Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. However, I'm going to make an addition to that statement, addendum to that statement I made, that condemnation came to all men, without exception, even to the elect, on the basis of Adam's sin, there's an addendum. There's something that we can add. Right, Pastor? That's not the end of the story. I cannot leave it there. I have to clarify it. I have to make it plain now. So, Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So, who shed his blood? Christ shed blood. However, the condemnation of death, or death is not administered to, the, to us, to the we, to the elect, by Adam's sin, it is not accredited to our account. We are not condemned to death because we have not escaped. Blood was shed. Christ's blood was shed. So God the Father can now freely forgive us. He does not overlook my sin. He does not cast away my sin into like oblivion. He placed upon Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. All of us, like she had gone astray, we turned to our own way, and the Lord laid our strain, our sin upon Christ. So the only way that we can be free from sin is because Christ paid for our sin. So the condemnation of death, our death is not administered to us. We the elect, we the elect, are set free because Christ, who is our surety, stands in our place and receives our punishment. All of us, like she went astray, we turned to our own way. But God the Father laid our iniquity upon Christ. And if you know anything about sheep, they let us stray. But I would say humans are like that also. Sometimes we are so oblivious. We walk around like we're blinders. We don't even think what we are doing. We're just doing things haphazardly. And it's by nature. It is it's our instinct. It's because you remember, it's just a nature as a rule in you, right? So you're just doing things without oblivious to what's going to be the charge or, or, or oblivious to the offense that you're giving to God or to the word of God or to the law. And if the law could come alive, it would slap you in the face and say, what are you doing? The law would kill you. I'm telling you, pastor. Yeah. The law would, the law would kill you. <laughs> it would, it would be merciful to you. If it had a, if it had a bud in the personality, it would do that to you. But you see, the law of God is trying to brought as written in our hearts, and it, 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 it controls us. Now it's our friend, because Christ paid for our sin. Christ obeyed the law perfectly, and that obedience was credited to our account. So the law sees us as following its dictates perfectly. What do you think? Jesus said, I don't have to condemn you. There's one that will condemn you. Even Moses. How did Moses condemn the, 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 the Jews? By the law. The law condemned them. And they condemn us also. Don't think we are free from the law. And look, it says this. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus had freed me from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sin and flesh to condemn sin in the flesh so that we could now become free or that we could become righteous or we could receive the version of God in him or in Christ or through Christ. The law, the law condemned us too, but we were set free by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Because you see something here now. Remember something. When Christ was obedient to the law and he died and he shed his blood, we died with him. And he gave us life, spiritual life. He was offered up for our offenses. But he was brought back to life for our justification. Why, why is that so? Because when, when Christ was resurrected from the dead, all our sins was left in the grave. That's right. And he then imputes his own righteousness to us. It's not my righteousness. He repeated his righteousness. His righteousness. So God sees Christ's righteousness upon me. He sees my sins on Christ. And he sees Christ's righteousness upon me. That is the only way that God justifies me. I want to move along a little bit quicker here. 
Come on, I finish soon. It said, even so by the writings of one, the free gift came upon all men on the justification of life. Our eternal life came upon all men that believe. All the many that were chosen. The free gift, or I, I, I see if we can use another term, eternal life, free gift, and eternal life is the same thing, came upon all men for what reason? There's a reason to justification of life. That is, the righteousness of Christ is freely imputed unto all men, all persons that belong to him, only those that belong to him. That are in him, that were given to him by the Father in eternity past, that he died for, that he prayed for, came to seek for, and who believe in him, not by any work, but by faith. So you see who the free gift is given to? The many, the called, the elect, the us, the we, the ones that believe, the ones that were chosen, the ones that were redeemed. The one that was set free, the one that the Father pardons. Consider that the pronouncement of the justification was formulated in the mind of God from all eternity, when all of the elect were ordained to eternal life. This plan was formulated, was designed, right? Was established in God's mind from all eternity. Who are going to be the ones that Christ will die for? You know, last session I read in Leviticus when God told Aaron to make two ephods. Right? And made them on, on right shoulder, the right shoulder and the left shoulder. An ephod is like a plate made of stone. And he told them to write the names of six tribes and one and the name of the other sons of Israel or Jacob six and the other six tribes and one six tribes and the other and whenever he goes into the holy of holies the most holy place he wear that he goes in and he takes the name of the sons of Israel before God and makes intercession for them that's the same concept. That was a type. Because Christ now, when he died, he came with a list. A name of all of his elect. All of his sheep. All of the many with him. And he died for them. And when he died, he took that blood and went to heaven, to the mercy seat, and applied the blood there for them. Those names that were written down, that are written down in the book of life. Not for any and everybody. Nobody else can go on that list. That list was made up already, Pastor, from eternity past. God doesn't add names to that book or that list every day. No, 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 no. It's already done. It's sealed. The book is sealed. Isn't the book sealed right now? It doesn't, it doesn't say that, that there was a book sealed that John saw that was there and nobody opened the book. And he says, what is me? What's going to happen here? He said, he said, don't cry. There's one That's right. that overcame. Oh, hallelujah. That had the rights to open the book. And he saw a lamb went and take the book and open it. He sealed. God doesn't add to anything. All the works of God are known to him from eternity. All that God's going to do is already done in God's mind and plan and purpose. It just, it just needed to be now, I would say, manifested in time. Open up or unfold in time. It's a pattern a man wants to die, right? Remember that? And I said that every man's life has already been mapped out by God. You will not die before your time. Or you can be born before your time. There's no such thing as a tiny death. A person died before their time. You might think so in your... If you're going to use men's words to describe the action, but not in God's mind, not in actuality. That is just like a, a metaphor then. 
Right? Let me make those kind of statements. It's metaphorical. But it's not reality. Because your time of existence on earth is determined by God. All of man's days are numbered. If very here, your head is numbered. Since all of this is true, all I just said to you is true. And applies to the to the believer. Let's consider some scripture in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, from verse 1, verse 1 to 6. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, you see? There is no judging guilty of wrong for those who are in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are not condemned. For those who are in Christ, who live and walk, not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of all new being, right? Has freed me from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law could not do. It's power being weakened by the flesh. The entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. Sending his own son in the guise of flesh, uh, in the guise of simple flesh, and as an orphan for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. He subdued it, he overcame it, and he deprived it of its power over all who accept that sacrifice. See again that word all? All meaning only those ones that accept that sacrificial death of Christ. So that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live. Again, that word, us. And move not in the way of the flesh, but in the ways of the spirit. Our life governed not by standards and according to the states of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which qualify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desire of the Spirit set their minds and seek those things which qualify the Holy Spirit. Alright, let's look at verse 28 to 39, Pastor. For the, in the interest of time, I want to show you something here. Romans 8 from verse 28. We are assured and know that God being a partner in our labor, or in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into our plan for good. For those who love God and who are called according to his design and purpose. The many, see the many, the, those that are called. If you are not called, you are not part of the many. For those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son and share it will lead his likeness that he might become the firstborn among many brethren and those whom he foreign he also called and those whom he called he also justified acquitted and made righteous putting them in right standing with himself and those whom he justified, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity and condition or state of being. What shall we say to all of this? What is the conclusion to all of this? If God is for us, that what us again, who can be against us? Who can be all for if God is on our side? He did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us again, for us all. Will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is going to condemn God's elect? When it is God who justifies, that is, who put us in right relation to himself? Who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Will God who acquits us? The answer is certainly not. Who is there to condemn us? Who can condemn us? Will Christ, Jesus Messiah, who died, or rather 
who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as he is for us, who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Shall suffering and affliction and tribulation or calamity and distress or persecution or hunger or destitution or peril or sword? Even as it is written, for thy sake, we, we, we are put to death all day long. We are regarded and comforted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, amidst all these things, we are more than conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loves us. For I am persuaded beyond doubt and sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things impending and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who is there to condemn? Who can condemn us? When God has justified us. So many are the ones that he will take the glory that have been set free by his blood. Having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So if you had any questions about many, the many that Christ died for, pay careful attention. Read the scriptures. Analyze them. And you'll see that all we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord have laid on him, on Christ, our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our people laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Today you can come to him. Fall at his feet for mercy. He's merciful. He's a merciful high priest. He's a merciful God. He will forgive you. But you must believe. You must trust him. You must rely upon him. The words I speak to you, they, they are spirit and they are life. They, it can be a ministry of life to you, but don't let it become a ministry of condemnation to you. Don't let it condemn you. Because these words, when you, when you are paid for the mercy seat of Christ, or let's say the judgment seat of Christ, sorry, the judgment seat of Christ, they will condemn you. They will condemn you. Because you rejected the word of life. May God bless and keep in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.